So we are not doing it the way you want. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Give them a round of applause. Come on. Now they're going up there. Radio check. Radio check. Radio check. All right. 2010, Afghanistan. Helmand province, the most hottest place on earth at that point. The insurgency enemy was fighting very hardly. US troops just increasing the number. We were operating uh, just in the middle of a hit, just in the middle of Elmond, a hit base. And uh, we had a, around company size units there, like 130 men and uh, some allies. Even though we were there, even though we were already in the war zone, we had some kind of problems and issues in our company. Starts from the training, where platoons were competing with each other. Who is the weakest one? Who doing better? Guys within the platoon also were competing. The relationships on some point weren't so good as they maybe should be. August, the same year, we were conducting the operation just near to our base, to push enemy a little bit farther from our base so we can operate more easily. There was a, two buildings in front of me. I was on my APC, just screening in front, making sure that guys can move from one build, building to another. And I remember exactly that particular tree there. And that, my thought was that it's a good marker to place the ID, ex improvised explosive device, which Taliban used. But as I saw the squad, the first squad, I was from the second, so first squad were walking through that, like five, six men, seven men already were past there. I started to look more forward. And the next moment, huge explosion went off just near to that tree. Hello, my name is Remo, and I'm a co-founder of Coma 3D. So, the video that you saw, it doesn't look maybe exactly like your world, but it is very similar. It has fast changes, you never have enough information, you never have enough resources, you're under stress, and you have to make decisions. And if you make a wrong decision, someone may die. So what's the difference between your field? Tell me. Is there any difference? People die in civilian world as well. We get into car accidents. A, if you're in a construction, a rock hits your head. If you're doing different type of things, you may get killed. You may get fired. All of your finances may go. So the, there are even more similarities. In all of the elite units where we come from, you have to recruit people. So it starts from selection. In 2010, while he was in Afghanistan, I joined the Special Forces. It started from there. It's an interview. It's one of the toughest interviews that Estonia has. It takes two weeks, and it's very fun. You will learn nothing about it. You will learn nothing there. There is zero skill that you will be teached. 
only thing that you will learn, you will learn things about you. And what we actually want to find is what kind of attributes does that person have? Is he selfless? Does he put the team first? Is he able to lead people around them? That's what we're looking for. All the skills, they come later. So, I think that you want the best talent, right? Or no? We want it the same way, so there's not much different in that aspect as well. Now, what comes to training? So let's think about, this is onboarding. You do the interview, and then you have to train. But you have to train for war. So how do you do that? I still love it. It's the best job ever. But what's the main difference about the educational system, at least where I was from? I didn't like to learn. I wanted to go to army when I was small already. But it's practical. Military training is 65% practical. 25% is demonstrational. A senior leader or senior guy tells you how to do things and only 10% is theory. You can't, get, you can't go to war like Russia. Here's a weapon, go and learn on the battlefield. You will die. We want to be prepared. We want to be a specialist. So I, I, my like, expertise was explosives. That was my job. We have programmers, we have different type of specialities that we want to be good at. On top of that, we need to be a team guy. I have to be able to shoot, move, and communicate. If I'm not able to do those basic things, I'm useless. It's very good that I know about explosives, but I'm not supporting the team where they need. So I have to be able to train on that as well. Now, environment changes all the time. We are here in Estonia, there is a lot of snow. There is not too much snow in Helmand, for example. There is not even a lot of mountains here in Estonia. But where we had to go, there was only mountains. So you have to be able to adapt. You have to build your training based on that. So you actually learn through practice. So we need to be more practical. That's why we have to train as we fight. Now, what's even more important is the culture. And if you come to the team, you don't have a culture. You have your culture, whatever, the, whatever it was. So now you have a decision, or you can decide what kind of culture we want eventually. And what we want in the teams, we want that we take responsibility of everything that happens. As leaders and as team members, we are not blaming anyone. Because if you blame, what happens? Even we get, even we get annoyed. And we are soft as well. We are men. We are soft. We just don't show it, because nobody doesn't have to know my weaknesses, right? But that's the baseline. It starts from me, and there is nobody else to blame. And that's where it starts from. Now, it's very awesome that we have a really good people, and we have really good training, and we have really awesome culture. But we will never know nothing about ourselves if we don't go to combat. And we have to go to war, because otherwise we are just practicing. But on, in the civilian side, you go to war on the first day, and the war starts, without that kind of preparation. 
So we went to Afghanistan, then we had to go there with the 10-man team, for example, and we had 1,000 locals, so we started, had to start fighting together with them. That's the only way to improve. You can't take leaders away from the battlefield and send them to school. As you can't take CEOs, executive level or whatever mid-level leaders, and you can't send them to school for a half a year. You don't have that luxury. So you have to train them on the battlefield together, because how else would they actually learn? How else they actually know what you're talking about? How do you win the trust? So we have to be in the trenches together with them. So every consultant who's saying to you that we will do only one class and that's it, then would you think that would work in Afghanistan? Hello, thousand people. Here is one presentation. Bye. And they go away. It takes years. And it took 20 years in Afghanistan and we still failed. Because we got too detached or attached. They got too attached. So we have to, we can't be a vampire who wants to suck out the blood. We want to go home. And the last one, even if we are in the war zone, we still have to train. We have to keep our shooting level. I can't train here on a stage how to give this presentation. I have to do it before. And even though when I go away and I've done 50 talks, I still have to prepare. I still have to learn. I still have to adapt. So the learning never stops. It was a sad dream that I had after the high school that now it's over. I don't have to learn anymore. But I was totally wrong. So, as I, as I told you, what, what we want to decide now here in the Combat Ready was that what kind of culture do we want in our team? We have 17 people team. They are the core of our business. They are the most important part about what we do. So, we thought, what we want? Do we want one leader in our team? Do we want to blame each other and point fingers? I guess no. So what we decided is that everyone in our team is a leader. <coughs> and that same applies on the battlefield. Everyone has to be a leader because your leader may die. So we are going that direction and that's the culture that we are building. And it doesn't matter the environment, the rules and the principles that apply in combat, they work everywhere. So huge explosion went off, as I mentioned. At that particular time, me, with my two tours, I already knew what will happen next. I knew that there will be injured, maybe killed. And the next, the next moment, like, I don't remember, as you know, where is the shooting starting and stuff uh, happening, the fly, time flies. It's like, as you're reading the good book, pretty much. And maybe in five minutes, the enemy opened the fire. I saw that particular part because I were covering in that direction. I opened my fire against the enemy. And then a lot of things happening. Radio all the time st started to work. Somebody talk, talking and talking some, something there. We realized that we have one via, wounded in action. Do not know yet how hard is that. And at the same time, like maybe 10 minutes or so, I hear from the radio that the platoon, the platoon, the same platoon we were competing all the time, searching for those weaknesses. Those guys were Egypt with their uniform, weapons, on the APCs, on the gate, ready to come out and help us out on the field. They were ready to do that. So next moment, what happened, we were driving back to the base, and we heard the information came from helicopter that our guy was now Kia, killed in action, so he didn't survive. So what we don't have to wait, all of these things what, we, what are written in military books, they are written with blood. And they, we had to learn the hard way. So there are four laws of combat. And the first law is cover and move which means that all the platoons and all the team, we have to work as one. The enemy is not, not inside our camp. It's outside the wire. 
It's over the eastern border. That's where our enemy is. Why the fuck are we fighting with each other? Now, we had our problems, but if one guy got killed or wounded, that's what made us stronger and actually started, and we actually started cover and move. We started to cover each other, but it took one guy to get killed. That's what usually happens. It's the same with politicians. If something goes wrong, then we put the tension over there. But if we don't follow these rules, we will fail. If we don't work as a team, then we're fucked. It doesn't matter how simply you do things. It doesn't matter what you prioritize. It doesn't matter how do you lead. You're done, because the enemy is inside you and you're already giving the cards to, to your enemy. They are winning. So if we are as a team, then we can move on and we need to understand where we go. So we really need to understand where we go. So that's, uh, that's what simple means. We need to understand the plan. Then we need to understand how to overcome the obstacles that are coming. We have to know how to do that, because there will be things on our way to the target. And if shit hits the fan, we need to understand how to make decisions. So we have to talk it through, and we have standard procedures which actually help us to move faster and communicate less. If we now are a team, we know where we have to go, and then we know how to deal with obstacles on our way. Now we have to decentralize our command. I can't tell to the troops in contact how they have to act. They have to do it themselves. I just want to know at some point what I have to do to support them. So that's the role of the leader. The role of the leader is not to micromanage. Because what happens if you micromanage? Guys will get killed and they will, not, they will stop thinking. But they need to think. Everyone needs to think. So, on top of the laws, there's mindset. So, you have to take ownership of everything, and you have to be humble. You have to be default aggressive. You have to innovate and adapt, and you have to be disciplined. You saw the Bolt CEO before. He was humble. He's, he's driving with a train. That's what humble means. You have to act the same way. Everyone at home, you're a leader. With friends, you're a leader. You're leading yourself, you're leading your team, you're leading your peers. So everyone in the team is actually a leader. It doesn't matter how you want to think about it, but that's how it is. Now the question is, how do you want to improve in that field? 2013, my third tour. I already were promoted to the NCO. I was a platoon sergeant, leading with my platoon commander, 30 plus men. And we were, we were well prepared. I used all my experience. I had a lot of new guys there in Platoon. Maybe some of them already were in Afghanistan, but not much. So what we did, we took all the things we learned previously from my previous tours, from another Platoons. We implemented all that we learned from there to our Platoon, particular Platoon, just to give our men the opportunity to decide where it's needed, to act when it's needed. They knew that we do not, will not blame them if they will do some, something wrongly on the field. And we had 178 contacts with the enemy during that mission. It's pretty much all our tour. And we brought all the guys back home safely. None of our guys were injured or wounded or killed during that mission. So what do you think? What is the big, biggest limitations? Usually people think that the biggest, lim biggest limitation is the time and the environment and all the excuses that we have. It's not. It doesn't matter how much resources you have in a project. It doesn't matter how much time you have. If you have the right team with the right mindset, you don't care we will execute anyways. Doesn't matter. So it starts from the right mindset. And if you have good relationships that you every day build, you can actually get to great teamwork. And if you have a great teamwork, you actually will solve problems. Every problem will be solved. There is zero problems that will not be solved. 
And I think that the startup community is exactly doing that. So, take extreme ownership and learn from the lessons. Through, if you take ownership of your life, you will be able to actually support troops and veterans. That's the biggest thing you can do. Because you are providing a service, and through the taxes, we can fight. So take ownership, lead yourself, your team, and everyone around you. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you very much for that. No more videos? We're good. We're no. Good. <laughs> uh, okay, going to some questions here. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about this idea of everyone's a leader? Because the confusion is, well, if everyone's a leader, doesn't that make confusion? Isn't everyone telling everybody else what to do? Dig into what this means that everyone's a leader a bit more. So, it doesn't matter what you think. You are a leader. You just may be a shitty one. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the, that's the main thing about it. But how do you... Leader doesn't have to talk. You have to be able to listen. You have to actually listen to your team. So you have to let them. So sometimes you have to follow. It's a dichotomy. There is extremes, but you have to be somewhere in the middle. And you have to be able to adapt. And it comes to practical training. But you will understand. Go to another room, or let's say that there will be a terrorist attack over here. You will be a leader. You have to act. There was a guy from the school, from the Estonian school, 17 year old. He asked the same question, please. How to become a leader? How can I become the leader? What I need to do? So my answer, I, I took the time, okay, 30 seconds or so, to think just a little bit about that question. And I answered him that just start acting already. Don't wait that time when you are going to start up, company, work, wherever you are going. Start already acting as a leader. Help your mother, help your brother, Help your friends, help your classmates, help your teacher. Just go ask if it's everything fine. No. How can I how, how can I help you? Hmm. <laughs> there will be answer. There will be answer. If there is no answer, then we still will build the relationship between us, and then we can proceed and do more things. And then it will show me as a leader, leader, not the leader who pointing and ordering by the leader who acting as a leader. That is most important thing. You spoke about uh, micromanaging and we're trying to not micromanage. And for myself, when I'm, I'm thinking about a team that I'm leading, whenever there's a problem, I start thinking about, well, to solve a problem, I think, how can I give responsibility? How can I give my people some responsibility to help them solve the problem? And can you talk a little bit there about the idea of commander's intent? that when I'm giving people responsibility not to micromanage. Talk about this a bit. So I think everyone has heard who Nazis, Nazis were, <laughs> right? So what they did, they used commander intent. It's a maneuver warfare. Intent comes with purpose, method, and end state. If you give that, minds can start getting on my head and we can already move. If you don't know the intent, we can't do anything. So if you give the intent, so what's the purpose? Where we have to go? Got it, we have to go there. And what does the winning look like? Winning looks like when you're there, for example. Now, the method, how do they get from point A to point B? Let the team make the plan. How else would they know? How else would they believe in their plan? If it's my plan, if it's in my head, you wouldn't believe it. You didn't even care because maybe you want me to fail. Because it was my plan already. You didn't believe in it. So it has to be your plan. So that's how you give ownership and let them come up with the plan and let them execute. You can ask questions. If it's a ridiculous idea, ask why. Why? Be sincere. You actually have to want to understand why they come up with the solution. Because maybe you are wrong. So you have to be humble as a leader. You have to give ownership to get the ownership from them. And you have to take it yourself as well. How often, you guys, uh, there is CEOs 
huge guys from the companies leading the guys, how often when you receive the problem or some kind of task, how much time it takes for you to resolve that in your head? How much, how much time it takes to become with the task, with the solution? 40 seconds. Five seconds, 10 seconds, 45, I already know what to do. I bring that guys there to the brief room, listening, really maybe not listening them. Okay, don't care, we just, I know how to do already. But if you give them the opportunity to become with plan, and if this plan is 70%, and in your head it's 90 or so, give them the opportunity to make that plan happen and just help them to make it 100. It's an excellent point. If your subordinates come up with a plan and it's 75% of the way there, let them do it. Just let them do it. It's, it's better that they own it. All right, guys, we need to move on, but thank you very much. Please, round of applause for Jonathan today. Can you please give applause to our team also sitting there? Thank you.